yesterday I found it and I thought it would also be useful for this workshop. And I've updated the statistics a bit. Uh, what I mainly want to talk about here is uh, mobile statistics. And uh, the theory of mobile as, a seven, as the seventh mass medium. Have you ever, anyone ever heard of this theory? It's, called, uh, it's by a guy called uh, Tommy Ahonen. He's an ex uh, Nokia exec. And he's, he's now a freelance consultant. And he thought up the idea of mobile as the seventh mass medium in human history. Um, it's maybe, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting theory. I don't entirely believe it, but it's interesting enough uh, that I'm going to share. What uh, Tommy Ahonen is saying is that uh, the first mass medium ever was invented around 1500, and we're talking about print. Because print, for the first time, gave people the opportunity to write something and reach out to masses. I mean, before that, everything had to be handwritten, right? If you wrote a book uh, in ancient Rome, for instance, if you were a writer, you would go to a publisher, and that publisher would have about 20 to 30 scribes and one reader, and the reader would read out the book slowly and the scribes would copy it. Um, that's all kind of cool in an artisanal way, but it's uh, not really uh, suitable as a mass medium. Print changed all that. Um, um, it made possible not only the dissemination of ideas, but also uh, it encouraged people to become literate. Because now uh, a, uh, uh, a literacy primer was much cheaper than it used to be. Right? So this was the first mass medium. And for a long time it remained the only mass medium. I mean, uh, newspapers were invented in the 17th century, uh, but they are not as fundamentally different from books. In the late 19th century came recordings, just, you know, the old-fashioned uh, uh, black things that you can throw like a frisbee. You remember those, right? And they were the second mass medium because now we could bring especially music to the masses. And it's, uh, these two uh, mass media changed the way we thought about the written word and especially music and to a lesser extent the spoken word. So they had prof a profound impact on society as a whole. Along came cinema as the third mass medium, and of course that was uh, used to create films. Now the interesting part, uh, if you l uh, look at really, really early uh, movies, say from 1900 to 1910, uh, what uh, the early movie directors uh, did was uh, taking stage actors to the screen. And the problem was that back then, um, stage acting was very over the top. I mean, you were supposed to do this and that, and talk to people like this, and really show your, your heart and uh, throw it out into the audience, because this was a way of doing it. And it was partly a fashion back then, uh, just a theater fashion, but the, uh, the initial movie actors did the same on the screen and turned out not to work at all on a film, because you have to be much more subtle. So what we're seeing here is that, that with the start of a mass medium, um, we unconsciously copy what we already know, even though it doesn't make sense on the medium. And that's an important thing. <clears throat> Along came radio. Um, um, radio had a different problem, because you could say, okay, radio makes re uh, recordings obsolete. Because now you can just turn on the radio and listen to something. Turns out that was not the case. And that was mostly because on radio you're dependent on uh, what the broadcaster is sending, while uh, on recordings you can choose for yourself. So radio was kind of vaguely expected to eat into recordings, but it didn't. And that's also an important theme in these seven mass mediums. Then came TV. Um, originally, again, people expected TV to eat into the market share of both radio and cinema, because we can now combine radio and cinema and give you something new in your own home. 
Turns out, again, that, that was not the case because there is an important social aspect to cinema that's mostly lacking from TV. Because you go to a movie together, right? You meet up with a few friends, you choose a new movie, you go to the cinema, and you have some popcorn, and you have a Coke, and you sit down, and it's a social aspect to that. Uh, that TV didn't quite replicate. And then came the internet as the sixth me uh, mass medium. And again, it was expected that the internet would eat all the other mediums. Because you can read online, you can listen to something online, you can see films online, you can even listen to radio and watch TV online. Again, that's not really panning out. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the printed book is in trouble. We all know that, you know. Uh, uh, bookstores are closing down, uh, publishers having less money. But the question is, will print as a mass medium actually disappear entirely? And personally, I don't think it will. Though it will become more of a rarity, more of a collector's item, and more for old-fashioned people like me who grow, uh, grew up with books and still like them. So, I mean, stuff is suddenly going to change, but uh, one of the points uh, Tommy Ahonen is making is that any previous mass medium does not necessarily make, uh, excuse me, any new mass medium does not make uh, any of the previous run obsolete. It just changes the way we think about it. And again, think about the early days of the internet. Right? When we started to create websites in 93, 94, what did we do? We literally copied print design because we didn't know what else to do. It's like the actors, right? It's like the actors in the cinema who just played as if they were on stage because they didn't know what else to do. Meanwhile, we are figuring out that uh, web design is something completely different from print design, but it has taken us close to 20 years to get to a point where we can now point at the differences. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry. The main point is that um, mobile is again threatening to take over uh, all the other mass mediums, but probably won't. And that on mobile, again, we started out doing the stuff that we were used to on the internet. And um, it turns out, you know, the mobile screen is just smaller. So we've eventually figured out responsive design. But uh, again, it changes the way we think about the earlier mass mediums, but it doesn't make them obsolete. This, in a nutshell, is Tommy Ahonen's uh, theory, and I mention this mostly because it's an interesting way of looking at things. It's a way of figuring out where mobile stands in society. Because mobile is all of the previous ones, plus more, because you can actually talk to people. So, with that said, let's take a look at some mobile stats. This is a, a bit of a random presentation. I gave this presentation or originally for two companies in Holland um, who wanted to know more about mobile. So, it's not really technical, but it gives you some background information. I want to talk a bit about mobile stats, because what exactly are mobile stats? Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that as soon as you see any statistics about any aspect of mobile, think very carefully what they mean, what they represent, and what they mean to you as a web developer. Um, because the most important thing for us is to know how mobile is evolving on the web. Um, this is a graph of the number of hits on websites that come from a mobile device. Not a desktop, not a tablet, just a mobile device. And we see that in 2009 it was about 2%, and now in the US it has risen to about uh, 14%. That is, 14 out of 100 people that visit your website use a mobile device. I mean, I don't have to convince you that mobile is important, but the point I want to make is uh, that while in the US it may be important, in other countries it's way more important. What's oh yeah, first we compare it to the UK, it's roughly the same. I'm not totally sure why the UK is temporarily higher in 2012 something may have happened. Uh, this is one of the things. Um, don't get too hung up on tiny differences like this. It may be a statistical artifact of the way uh, StatCounter uh, gathers these numbers. It may mean something like uh, there was a device introduced on the UK market which temporarily gave a boost to mo mobile web use. Um, 
or it may me mean something else entirely. But to you as a web developer, that's not tremendously important. What's important to know is that the US and the UK, and in fact all developed nations in the West, follow roughly the same path. I mean, I expect this line to continue for a while, although there will be a ceiling. Right? At a certain point, this line will start to flatten out because a certain percentage of uh, hits on websites will still come from desktop because we all have desktop computers and sometimes it's just more useful to do something on a desktop computer than on a mobile. But nobody knows where that ceiling is. I have no clue in any case. We just have to wait and see and find out. And now comes some really shocking news. We are going to compare the US and the UK with India. And as you're seeing, uh, in India uh, last year, well over one half of hits to websites came from mobile devices, which is way more than in the US or the UK or any developed nation. Why is that? Because the, uh, up until now, the average consumer in India and Nigeria and uh, Indonesia, um, up to a point even in Latin America, they simply could not afford a desktop computer. It was too expensive. But they can afford a mobile phone, especially a cheap mobile phone, with Opera Mini on it, for instance. So all of a sudden, they now gain access to the internet. This is not people switching over from desktop. This is entirely new people who so far haven't had internet access yet coming online because of cheap mobile phones and proxy browsers. And that's what's going on in the developing world now. And that is where the really fascinating stuff is going to happen, because I think that a substantial number of innovations uh, that we will see in the next 10 to 15 years will actually come from the developing world. Uh, have you heard, for instance, of M-Pesa? Uh, M-Pesa, uh, M-P-A-S-A, uh, P-E-S-A, is um, the most advanced uh, mobile banking system in the world. Um, it's being used in Kenya, in East Africa. Because up until now, people in Kenya have not had a bank account because they just had too little money. But now they can send money via SMS. So they just send a text message to somebody else, and that pays that somebody else a certain amount of money. Even better, the system was originally invented for people who went to the, to the city and made a lot of money, and they wanted to send their family at home some money. Now, uh, they could uh, give it to someone, uh, so that, that someone would bring it to their mother or their father or whoever, but that depends on trust, right? Some people would just steal the money and never give uh, anything. <coughs> Uh, using uh, modern banking was not possible because they, uh, especially the people uh, back in the village, just didn't have any banking system whatsoever because they were just not wealthy enough. So they said, okay, you can send it via SMS now. And it will come to your mother's phone. There was a whole campaign, you know, with a, a happy city dweller uh, sending an SMS to his uh, happy mother uh, in the countryside. And uh, this was the way they could send uh, money to their relatives. And even more, um, they could send a special code to their relatives. Their relatives could go up to an ATM without uh, any card whatsoever, type in the code, get money. This is the kind of innovation we will see a lot more because up until now, Kenya and countries like it have not had a banking system. So they are not weighed down by uh, endless uh, years of practice of, uh, of using money in a certain way. They can just invent something completely new. So that's the really uh, interesting and important thing that I think is going to happen with mobile especially in the developing world. In any case, um, does anyone of you work on sites that are also visited by a substantial number of people outside the developed world? Nobody, okay. Um, keep this in the back of your mind. Eventually, at least some of you will get a request, hey, I want to roll out this uh, service in India or Indonesia or China or whatever. Remember that mobile use there is way higher than we used to and that the mobile browsers they use over there are way different than ours. Mostly because of the proxy browsers I explained earlier. 
Let's just take a look at some market shares. Um, these are sales market shares. Uh, it's all for 2013, full year 2013. Well, no surprise here. Android takes the lion's share, 78%, uh, and iOS 16%, and the rest is almost irrelevant. Again, these numbers come from Tommy Ahonen, the same guy as the seventh uh, mass medium. This is interesting. And you should definitely kind of follow sales stats around because it will tell you what's going to come. However, this uh, is not a measure for what people actually have in their pockets nowadays. Because on average, uh, in the developed world, people get a new phone every two years. Which means that everybody who got a phone in 2013, 78% uh, of them took Android, but that doesn't say anything about 2012. There were plenty of people who bought, uh, say, a Nokia Symbian phone in 2012, and they're not happy with it, and when, they are, when their contract is up for renewal, they will certainly get an Android, but for the moment, they still have a Symbian phone in their pocket. And if they want to surf the mobile web right now, they will use that Symbian phone, which has different browsers than the Android phones. So that's how we come to the installed base market share. That is basically what do people have in their pockets right now. And you will see that the Android percentage is distinctly lower. Why? Because still plenty of people carry a much older phone. Uh, iOS is still higher. Um, Apple's market share is slowly declining from 20% to 15% of the smartphone market. And that is mostly because Apple doesn't have a cheap device. I mean, this whole tremendous Android growth is mostly fueled by cheap devices. Right? If you go to uh, a developing nation nowadays, you will find that most people carry a cheap device, and nowadays a, carry, a cheap device means an Android device. Uh, there used to be the Nokia S40 uh, feature phones, uh, but they've fa fallen out of favor, and people use Android. And the point to remember here is that a lot of this growth is actually fueled by developing nations buying cheap Android phones. Which also points to another problem. These are global statistics. And global statistics are kind of interesting, and I like them, but they do not necessarily apply to the US or to any other country. Because I don't have the numbers, because uh, these numbers are hard to come by, but uh, I'm fairly certain that the iOS uh, sales market share in the US is quite a bit higher than 16%. Um, okay, so we have sales, which is kind of interesting and points to the future. We have installed base, which tells you uh, what people have in their pockets right now. But by far the most important metric for web developers is, of course, browser market share. And this is the browser market share of 2013. And as you can see, it's completely, completely different from the desktop. The biggest browser in 2013 was Android WebKit, which is the old default browser on Android. Second biggest is Safari. Third biggest is actually Opera, and Opera here means mostly Opera Mini. These are the people in developing nations that I keep talking about that browse the web on their cheap phone with Opera Mini. They are responsible for these hits. Then we have the UC browser in China, right? I mentioned it already. Um, this is probably also mostly UC Mini, because UC is now uh, aggressively trying to oust Opera uh, from uh, the prime uh, proxy browsing spot. They are doing a lot of stuff, and I see their market share rise and rise and rise in countries like India. Um, yeah, and then we have others, whatever. Um, so, if you find statistics somewhere online, in general, they will fall into one of these three categories. They may be per country, which is actually more useful than global statistics. Um, but always carefully consider, okay, are these sales, installed base, or browser, excuse me, uh, browser share statistics? Because the, the third is really the most important one to you. Currently, I know of only a single source for uh, global uh, mobile browser, uh, uh, browser shares, and that is statcounter.com. Uh, statcounter.com is your typical analytics uh, package that you can install in your site, and as a service to the community as a whole, they give out uh, browser, uh, global browser stats. Um, I follow them mainly because there's nothing else. 
About a year ago, Akamai uh, tried to release a similar set of data. The problem is that the interface doesn't work. Don't know if you, uh, uh, any of you have ever tried the Akamai global browser stats. Once you try to switch to mobile browsers, it doesn't actually work. It does nothing, and it has done nothing for the past year or so, which is why StatCounter is still the only player in town. So let's look at a few StatCounter things. Uh, this is the global market share, right? Now let's take a look at the US. Completely different. Safari has well over 50%. Android, which is the old Android browser, is 33 And Chrome is only at 5%. People tend, to, uh, what developers especially, tend to think that most Android users use Chrome yet nowadays. That is not true. Even worse, I will talk about browsers later, and we'll see that most of this Chrome is actually not Google Chrome, but another Chrome. So, don't set too much stock on your testing on Google Chrome. I mean, it's useful to have around, and you should certainly test in it, but it doesn't necessarily say a lot about non-Google devices. And that's one of the tricks of the mobile browser market you have to learn. And the rest in the US is minimal. Now, let's take a look at India. Completely different. We see that UC is now narrowly larger than Opera. Again, this is UC Mini and Opera Mini, right? There's a battle of the proxy browsers being fought here. And what they basically try to do is offer uh, device vendors or carriers a good deal. They say, okay, we want to be on your device. I think that's UC strategy now especially, because if a uh, device that you buy already comes with a decent proxy browser, you're, you will not download another one. Right? So, um, this is, it, it can be compared a little bit like the old situation with IE on Windows, right? IE gets delivered together with Windows, so back in the day most people didn't, didn't look any further and just used IE. The same up to a point happens with mobile phones, because the average consumer will just take the browser that's already on his mobile phone and will not download another. We as web developers download a lot of browsers because we like that, because we want to compare that, because we have our own favorites. The average consumer does not. There's only one exception to that rule, and that is downloading a proxy browser if the device you have does not already have a proxy browser. That is something that consumers will do because it saves them money. But the average consumer doesn't really care about the difference between Android WebKit and Chrome and Firefox and all the rest. So we still see Android, again, the old Android browser still having a decent market share, and there's a lot of other browsers. Safari, 1%. IE, 1%. And what's the, uh, Chrome, 1%. So the, what we think of as modern browsers are irrelevant in India. Again, I'm showing these statistics mostly to uh, have you encounter uh, how mobile works in other parts of the world. If you ever start working on a mobile website that's meant for another country, uh, carefully look at the browser statistics because they will likely be completely different than the ones you're used to in the US. And of course, the absolutely most important thing you can do is look at the server logs of your clients. Which browsers already come to their site? If for some, oh yeah, nice story. And this was years ago, mind you, and um, uh, a friend of mine who uh, was a mobile web developer even before the iPhone uh, was asked to create a website for a company that stripped buildings ready for demolition. That is, uh, the building was emptied uh, by the leaser. This company would move in and strip everything, and after that the building could be demolished. And they wanted a website. So, this friend of mine started thinking, okay, what's the use case for such a website? And she thought, you know what's go probably going to happen? There's some kind of, uh, I forget the word, but uh, some kind of investor or something who thinks, okay, I want to uh, demolish this building and, uh, and set up a new one. So he enters the building and sees, okay, it has to be stripped. So he looks at, uh, takes his mobile phone out to search for somebody who can do that to him. And back five, six years ago, what kind of mobile phone uh, would such a person have? A BlackBerry, because that was still the business phone. 
right? So she assu uh, assumed that BlackBerry was really important for that uh, client, and she made sure that her site worked perfectly fine on all the Blackberries. Turned out she was completely right. More than half of the total visits to that site came from BlackBerry. Not mobile visits, total visits. Which only goes to show that sometimes websites have completely uh, different uh, browser ma uh, market pr uh, patterns than others. I mean, all these global uh, stuff that we saw, it's interesting, you should definitely follow it, but if you have an actual client that actually asks you to help with his mobile website, always ask for their server logs and try to analyze them and try to figure out what they are getting. Another useful trick, once you're uh, doing the server logs, is to compare the numbers for the home page, or another very important portal page, to numbers of deeper lying pages. You will often find that there are discrepancies between the two. For instance, that the home page gets 7% uh, Opera Mini, I'm making this up, but any following pages only get less than 1% of Opera Mini. Uh, that likely means that in the process of navigating from the home page to another page, Opera Mini users encounter problems and stop using the website. So it might be useful to take a look at that and to figure out if you can do something about those problems without uh, spending too much budget. Uh, these are the tricks you have to use. So always take a look at the server logs of your clients. If you don't have them, which occurs, uh, look at your country's general stats from statcounter.com, so the US stats, basically. Um, because global stats aren't going to tell you all that much uh, for the US. And global, use global stats only if el uh, all else fails. So this is how you figure out which mobile browsers actually visit your client's site. Then a brief word about mobile context, which, oh yeah, I'd forgotten this slide. According to Tommy Ahonen, uh, mobile has eight unique abilities uh, that uh, cannot be duplicated anywhere else. First of all, a mobile phone is intensely personal. It's yours and yours only. I mean, if I look over your shoulder to your uh, desktop or laptop computer, you're kind of okay with that. But if I look at your mobile phone, it's a completely different story, right? You don't like people, other people watching your mobile phone because it's yours. Secondly, it's permanently carried. And if I say permanently, I mean permanently. How many of you leave your mobile phone next to your bed at night? There you go, permanently carried. No other device has this, right? I sometimes uh, put this computer next to my bed if I've done some surfing uh, just before going to sleep. But it won't wake me up when a text message arrives. And your, uh, your mobile phone will wake you up sometimes. It's always on, which is, uh, the, uh, which is the same. You know, if a text message arrives, I mean, some people actually get up in the middle of the night if a text message arrives. I don't, personally, I don't like that. But some of you may, and some consumers will certainly do that. It has a built-in payment mechanism. Uh, this is a complicated one because uh, although in theory it's true, in practice it's not much used. The built-in payment mechanism is your contract with your carrier. It would be really easy for the carrier to say, okay, you have purchased uh, access to an article uh, on the New York Times or um, uh, you know, like those micropayments. Ten years ago, we used to talk about micropayments on the web. It never t uh, took off, mostly because there was no reliable uh, payment mechanism. Mobile phones already have one because your carrier is sending you a monthly bill anyway. The problem is that carriers don't really use this power. It could be a tremendous source of power to them. They could actually become the new banks of the world if they wanted to. Curiously, they don't. They don't seem to see the immense potential here because they're too hung up on just providing connections and making themselves unique uh, in the eyes of the consumer. So this is a complicated one. It's available at the moment of creative inspiration. These are not my words, these are Tommy's words. Uh, which basically means you can take a picture whenever you like. Um, that seems kind of obvious, but so far, before the mobile re revolution, it wasn't really true. Sure, you could carry a camera, but uh, with a mobile phone, you just do clack, 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 and you've got the photo. And with a camera, you know, you have to take it out, and you have to focus, and everything, and it goes a bit slower. Besides, not everybody's carrying a camera. Well, everybody's carrying a mobile phone. 
accurate audience measurement. I am afraid I have forgotten what that means. It captures the social context of media consumption. Uh, example, uh, location with photos. You can uh, automatically send on information about your location while you took a certain picture, which is very useful to comparing you to other people in certain situations. And the uh, eighth one is augmented reality. Uh, I do not entirely agree with Tommy here. I think augmented reality uh, does not necessarily mean uh, a mobile phone, but it can certainly also work on mobile phones, right? Um, you have these experiments uh, when you install a certain app and you look through the camera of your phone. Uh, at least in Holland we have one, and then you see a house. And the augmented reality app makes a connection to uh, the, a, a certain big real estate uh, site, and it tells you, hey, that house is for sale. That was actually a use case uh, they thought up in Holland. We still don't know what augmented rea reality really means or really is. In fact, uh, Tommy, again, is saying that augmented reality will become the eighth mass medium. I'm not totally sure about that, but it's still interesting to think about. Because if you can put a layer of information over what you see, it's kind of interesting, although it's also still kind of vague, you know. You could do something like that with Google Glasses, I suppose, or with any kind of wearables. Um, but we don't really know what it means yet. Again, going back to the seven uh, mass mediums, um, we try to figure out what to do with augmented reality by just doing stuff we used to do before on another ma mass medium that may not be entirely suited to the new one. So, we haven't figured it out yet. Um, the mobile context does not depend on your device, but on your situation. This is an old theory, uh, like uh, the user goes to the station because he wants to catch a train, and the mobile device detects his, uh, his position, and uh, uh, automatically offers departure times and platforms so that the user can see them at once. This was the old theory. It turns out that this is nonsense. Mobile context does not work like this. Problem is, I can't tell you how it does work because we don't know yet. Again, we are looking at mobile through the lens of things we learned before mobile was there. So we first have to figure out the specifically mobile way of doing things. Uh, Luke Rublevsky said it best. Uh, what was formerly the mobile context is becoming increasingly difficult to define. Context can't predict the way a user is going to use a site. Right? If I am at the station and I'm going to the railroad company's website, it does not necessarily mean that I want to know about departing trains. It could be that I want to uh, uh, find a ticket price. It could be that I want to know about an arriving train because my elderly mother is on it and I have to help and I have to go to the right platform, etc., etc. Mind reading is no basis for fundamental content decisions. There was a fashion a couple of years ago to try to figure out the mobile context for the user and to present special content in a way that people hoped would uh, be relevant to the mobile context, it turns out that you shouldn't do it because you cannot predict what the user is going to do next. So if anybody uh, ever talks to you about mobile context, just nod wisely and forget about it. We just don't know what it is yet. Um, yeah, we are copying the desktop web right now on mobile. I mean, even with responsive design, what we do is in our mind, we think about, okay, here's how I would do it on desktop, but mobile si uh, screen size is smaller, so I have to put this on top and that below. Which is a good first step to set. I mean, responsive design is important, and it may actually be that your site uh, will be perfectly fine if you think like that. But it could also be that the mobile context asks for something different. Uh, we just cannot tell yet. Uh, and let's think about tablets. The tablet context is likely to be different than the mobile context. I mean, what was the story again? There, were, there are only three ways of holding a mobile phone. The first one is like this. The second one is like this. And the third one, I have forgotten. I'm so sorry. Cradle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, with the, with the index finger instead of your thumb. Yeah. So those are the three ways in which people use mobile phones. And you can use that when you create uh, a user interface. 
But the tablet usage is completely different. There are so many ways of using a tablet. I mean, think, uh, think about yourself. In what, which ways do you use a tablet? In which ways do you hold the tablet, you know, when you're lying uh, on your bed, or when you're sitting on the sofa, or when you're walking across the street? It's all completely different. <sighs> what about cars? Cars are going to get browsers. They're going to get, you know, uh, uh, information systems that are projected on the, uh, on the windshield and whatever. But I recently talked to somebody who knew somebody who'd done some research in that. Um, it turns out to be very difficult to decide on the correct uh, uh, amount of information to show. Because basically all their experiments so far showed either too much information, so that the user is distracted from the road, or too little information uh, where the whole uh, thing didn't make sense. It turns out to be extremely hard to define the car context. What kind of information do you want to see? We'll hear more about that. TV, same. Refrigerators. I don't know if you noticed, but every time you see something about, you know, the cloud of devices and all the new devices that are coming up, there's always a fridge in there. I don't know why you would want to serve the internet on your fridge. Personally, I would not want to do that. But, you know, if you want to do that, that's fine. But I find it hard to, you know, find a fridge context for your website. Probably something about beers. I don't know. Uh, we've already had this. Um, do you know the uh, mobile first theory by Luke Roblevsky? Yeah. I will briefly go through it. Because his idea is very simple and will help you a lot in setting up mobile websites. Uh, first of all, it's a design philosophy. It's not a technical trick. There are no uh, technical uh, stuff whatsoever. And the basic idea is to design your sites for mobile first because the mobile screen is so small. And instead of seeing the small screen as a problem, you can also see it as a solution. A solution to deciding what should be on a specific web page. Because if you are starting to truly work on a mobile site, you have to decide what is so important on that site that it must be shown on the mobile home screen as well. I mean, desktop websites have the tendency to become bloated, right? Uh, the marketing department uh, wants uh, something here to show their latest campaign. The HR department wants a bar here where it can uh, add 25 uh, incomprehensible links. Then you can download all kinds of spreadsheets and stuff and it has to go somewhere in the middle. It comes bloated, convoluted and completely uh, 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 difficult to use. On mobile you can't do that. On mobile, you have to decide, okay, this is so important that it has to be shown on the mobile website, on the mobile screen. And once you've done that, once you've figured out what is so important, it usually turns out that the things you did not select don't have to be on the desktop uh, homepage uh, either, because it's just not that important. And this is, again, a new way of starting to think about mobile web design. So, make a list of features and items that are on your current homepage. Remove all the features that are not important enough and make difficult choices here. And, um, in the end, it will help your website a great deal. Uh, oh yeah. In general, um, it's useful to place a navigation at the bottom of the page instead of at the top of the page. Why? Because if I go to a page, I want to read that page. It's like walking into a store and then a clerk coming up to say, hi, you can also go to the coffee shop and there's a great bookstore at the other end of the street. And what you could also do is walk uh, a block and a half and there you will find a nice restaurant. That doesn't make sense. You come into a store in order to buy something at that store. It's exactly the same for a mobile web page. You come to that web page in order to see the content on that web page. And that means putting the navigation at the bottom of the page and not at the top. Uh, either Luke or Ethan calls it a pivot point. You have read the stuff that you came to read. Now you may want to do something else on the site. And at that point in time, after you've read through the entire content of the page, then it might make sense to say, okay, you can also do this and that as such as so, and offer a lot of links. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I will show the 
responsive design, yeah, here it is. We took the same decision here. Um, we put the, ma the main navigation at the bottom of the page, but we uh, are, with Mobilism, a conference site. So what, what, what do we want to do? We want to sell tickets, right? That's the whole point of the site. Uh, what's the, the best way of selling tickets? It's showing the program. So we decided that these two links were so important they had to go on top anyway. But the about page and the venue page and that kind of stuff, that could easily be at the bottom. You, are go uh, as a user, are going to be convinced by reading the content by seeing the speakers, by thinking, hey, I want to go to that conference. If you want more information, it's most likely you want to know the exact program or the tickets uh, price. So we uh, provide links for that, and the rest will be at the bottom. So the general rule, if it's um, is equal in value or greater than the content with the links at the top, if not... Yeah, that would be a good way of putting it, yes. Yes, um, um, the only thing is restrict yourself to two or at most three items at the top. Because if you're doing more, you're likely making a mistake uh, uh, in thinking about the site. But yeah, no, that's an excellent way of putting it. We find that the program and the tickets link are so important that they, they are equally or even more important than the actual content. Okay, um, I have wandered around into a more like usability UX general talk. I hope you don't mind. We are going to do solid technical content later on, I promise you, but I just wanted to tell this. Let me see, I think we're about done with this. Oh, wait a minute, I show it even here. Uh, um, again, this is a desktop site. We have plenty of space for all kinds of stuff. Um, so we put a navigation here and a sub-navigation and a little bit of news and of course the main content and that's all fine because we have plenty of space here, but here we don't. Right? This is the kind of, um, kind of uh, user interface decisions you will have to take. Uh, yeah. And secretly, mobile first is not about mobile at all. It's about all websites. Uh, you, should, you should see mobile as a catalyst for a new way of thinking about websites, for focusing on the stuff that's really, really important to your website. Right? Because uh, in the past, uh, our websites have become too cluttered, and mobile offers a, a unique opportunity to declutter them. And that, I think, is the end of this presentation. Yes, I hope you find, found this useful. It was not entirely in my script so far, but, you know, once I start talking, I keep talking. So, uh, if you want to say, stop a minute and explain this a bit more, please ask your questions now. Yes. Yes, I will talk about browsers. Yeah, I'm going to make that. Yes, I'm going to talk about browsers now. The only problem is that I don't have a real presentation for this. So I am going to go back to... No, no. Uh, yeah, let's take this one. No, let's take this one. I'm going to get a glass of water and then I'm going to talk at length about the mobile browser market. You have been warned. First, something obvious. Um, the browser that runs on a certain device depends on the operating system, right? Safari runs only on iOS, not on Android. Duh. Um, the problem is that while iOS and the smaller uh, operating systems have their own default browser and nothing much else, Android is much more complicated. So actually, uh, I think about 78% of this talk will be about Android. But let's start with, uh, with the easy stuff. Uh, iOS, Safari, obviously. The point is, and people tend to overlook this, that it is not possible to install another browser on iOS. 
That is, it's not possible to install its rendering engine. And the rendering engine of a browser is the part that actually interprets and renders the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So when you hear about Chrome on iOS, or Opera, uh, Opera Coast it's called, on iOS, or anything else on iOS, it's secretly Safari. It makes no sense whatsoever to test your website in Chrome on iOS because it's, with the exception, uh, with a few JavaScript ex exceptions, it's Safari. Each mobile platform has a default browser and a default web view. And the web view is almost, but not quite, the same as the default browser, but it's meant for apps. If I have a Twitter client, uh, the old Twitterific used to do this, and I click a link uh, on, in a tweet, and that would open uh, in a special pane in Twitterific, uh, but it was a web page, so they needed an actual browser to show it. That browser is the web view. It's not exactly the same as the default browser. On iOS, I happen to know most, um, in HTML and CSS, it's basically Safari. In JavaScript, it's not, because they use a different JavaScript rendering engine. And that is mostly because of security concerns. Uh, the, I have to say this, right? I think it's the Nitro JavaScript engine that runs with the actual Safari browser. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, the WebView uses another a JavaScript engine whose name I currently can't remember. And again, the point here is that Nitro has certain, I wouldn't call it flaws, but security issues that make it slightly unsafe to use in any context whatsoever. Because if you have an actual browser, uh, you as, a, uh, as an operating system vendor, uh, uh, you control the context. But in an app, you don't quite know what's going to happen. So that is a web view. Um, so what you get when you test Chrome on iOS is actually the iOS web view, which is almost the same as Safari, except for this sole uh, JavaScript engine thing. On Android, like always, it's much more complicated. The only actual other browser you can install on an iOS device is Opera Mini, because Opera Mini, the client, does not contain a rendering engine because the rendering engine is on the server. So when you install Opera Mini on your iOS device, which I recommend that you do, because you have to test an Opera Mini, um, then you actually get the Presto rendering engine which runs on the Opera Mini server. And it's actually different from Safari, but all the other browsers for iOS are basically the Safari web view. Something similar goes for BlackBerry and Windows Phone. It is, in theory, allowed to install other browsers on these platforms, but nobody's bothered to create them. So on BlackBerry, we have the BlackBerry WebKit browser, which is actually a pretty good browser. I think I already said that. Um, and on Windows Phone, we have IE, which is shaping up to become a pretty decent browser as well. I don't know if you followed IE 10 and especially IE 11. They are squashing bugs like mad, and it's becoming an actual browser. The only problem is, and I'm going to talk about that mainly uh, during the uh, touch point events presentation, is that they do some stuff different than the other browsers. They've always done that, but now they have good reasons, and that's something new. Back in the day, it used to be, we want IE to be different because we want IE to be different, right? Nowadays, um, I will talk about that more during the Touch and Poetry Events presentation. Okay. So that's iOS, BlackBerry, Windows Phone. It also goes for the uh, few minor operating systems that still survive, such as uh, Nokia Symbian. They're not really important anymore. Android. Oh my, oh my, Android. Okay. So a smartphone needs a browser, right? So, uh, at the very beginning, the Android team said, hey, we need a browser, we are going to create one. WebKit-based, I should talk about that as well. Um, there are four rendering engines right now. WebKit, Blink, uh, Gecko of uh, Firefox, and Trident, the IE rendering engine. All browsers in existence uh, are based on one of those four rendering engines, except for Opera Mini, which is still based on Presto. 
and Presto is the old Opera rendering engine which I used before switching to Blink. Blink is a split off from WebKit. Uh, up until about a year ago, uh, Chrome used WebKit, like Safari does, like most mobile browsers do. But uh, Google decided that the pace of change was too slow, and they decided to split off their own rendering engine. So at the very start, WebKit and Blink were just about the same, but now they're slowly diverging. So um, that basically means that you have to test in all browsers, but you were already doing that, right? Second, the second point about WebKit uh, is really important. Uh, it's that WebKit is very changeable. That is, um, there are all kinds of switches and things you can set. And besides, WebKit is not a uh, true, uh, a, a complete browser. It's more like a rendering engine. Again, uh, rendering the HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And what we're seeing there is that if you want to implement WebKit on your specific device, then you have to make sure yourself uh, that it actually connects to the screen. Because there's no actual uh, way of showing the WebKit rendered page on the screen unless you write one because everybody's uh, graphic layer is diff different, right? The Android graphic layer is completely different from the iOS one, completely different from the BlackBerry one. So you have to write that for yourself. You have to create a network stack uh, in your mobile phone, which basically means HTTP, TCP, and IP. That's not very difficult, but you still have to do it. So you have to kind of uh, encircle a WebKit with all kinds of components that you write yourself. Uh, and that is mainly the reason that no single WebKit browser is equal to any other WebKit browser. Please do not make the mistake of thinking, I am testing in one WebKit browser, Safari, so I cover all other WebKit browsers. You do not. There are vast differences. Um, an additional problem with WebKit was that all these platform-specific stuff uh, they were writing uh, needed uh, some extra code within the WebKit base itself. So even Safari nowadays, uh, the Safari WebKit implementation, contains uh, quite a few lines of code that are actually meant for BlackBerry and that are simply not being used on iOS at all. And the opposite is also true. The BlackBerry WebKit browser also contains uh, iOS-specific code. Um, I think this was mostly uh, due to mistakes in uh, the early days of creating WebKit. They were, um, it's, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, Google wanted to split off Chrome from the main WebKit trunk and create Blink. Okay, so we have WebKit. No, wait a minute. We start with the smaller ones. We have Trident, which is for IE and IE only. We have Gecko, which is mostly but not entirely for Firefox. Um, it turns out that a very few mobile browser vendors do use Gecko, and that is mostly the UC Mini uh, browser that we saw earlier. Uh, UC is weird because they have a full browser and it uses WebKit, and they have a mini browser and it uses Gecko. Don't ask me why, I don't know, just to make it complicated for us web developers. And then there's the Nokia Express uh, proxy browser, which is meant for old Nokia devices, and it also runs on Gecko. So it's Trident, that's Gecko. Presto, again, the old Opera rendering engine is for Opera Mini and for, uh, yeah, they call it Opera Classic now. You can still download Opera Mobile 12. I have no clue why you would want to do that, but you can and still runs on Presto. Uh, Opera up to 12 is Presto. Opera 14 and beyond is Blink. Because when Google decided to split off Blink from WebKit, uh, pretty soon thereafter, Opera announced that they were going to go over from Presto to Blink. Does that mean that Opera is the same as Chrome? Most of the time, but not entirely. This is, in fact, one of the other things I'm going to test in the future because uh, there are several implementations of Chrome, Chromium, Blink, however you want to call it. Blink is the rendering engine. Again, HTML, CSS. Then there's a JavaScript engine added to that. And that is all encapsulated within Chromium. And Chromium is Google's open source browser. You can download Chromium and make it your browser. And lots of people are doing that nowadays. Chrome 
is Google's specific implementation of Chromium. This is complicated, but you need to know, because right now Samsung is also creating its own Chromium-based browser. This is the Samsung Galaxy S4. Its default browser is Samsung Chromium 28, which means that Samsung took Chromium, open source browser, so they can, uh, twisted and tweaked it a little bit and used it as their default browser. Uh, the same uh, is going on at Amazon. Uh, the modern uh, Amazon uh, Kindle Fire browsers are also Chrome-based. I'm not sure when the switch over happened. Uh, Opera does it, and Nokia does it on the Nokia X devices, which I have to remember talking about later, because Nokia X is the most interesting thing that has happened in mobile in the last year, for reasons I will talk about later. So we're seeing um, a split up into several flavors of Chrome or Chromium, however you want to call it. I currently do not know how much they differ. The only thing I do know is that I tested an older Samsung Chromium, uh, which was based on Chrome 18. I could compare it to the Google one, and it turns out that the Samsung one didn't support border radius. But it did support border radius top left, border radius bottom right, etc. Why? I have no clue. But this is the kind of minor but annoying things that you can find uh, as differences between the various Chromium-based browsers. Again, uh, this was, uh, will be one of my focal points uh, for fall. I'm definitely going to test uh, these uh, Chromium-based browsers because we need to know about the differences. So that is what has recently been happening on Android. Um, an additional problem is that many web developers think that Android 4.3 and up uh, run Chrome by default. That is not the case. In fact, Google's Chrome, uh, I've seen it as a default browser only on Google devices and on not a single non-Google device. As I said before, the, uh, the Galaxy one is uh, Samsung's Chromium and most other Android 4.3 devices actually still use the old browser, which is Android WebKit. And it's Android WebKit that is this and this is Chrome. And I think that this Chrome is actually mostly Samsung's Chrome because the Samsung Galaxy is a very widely distributed phone. Uh, I don't actually know because uh, Start Counter doesn't make a difference between Google's and Samsung's Chrome. I'm hoping they will in the future, but I would not be surprised if that was the case. But still, Chrome as a whole, even with uh, Samsung combined, is still tiny compared to Android WebKit. Android WebKit is based on WebKit. Uh, one of the problems you see in the mobile market is that many browser vendors refuse to give their browser a name. Uh, so I invent them myself. I have Android WebKit, which is the WebKit-based browser running on Android. BlackBerry WebKit, the WebKit-based browser running on Bla uh, BlackBerry. Symbian WebKit, uh, there used to be a Palm WebKit for the old Palm WebOS. Many more WebKits. So these names are ugly and confusing, but I can't help it because browser vendors refuse to give their browsers names. So Android WebKit is the old Android default browser. It was created together with the Android operating system and it remained uh, in uh, development until Android 4.2. Then development ceased. If you took Android uh, to use as an operating system on your phone, you would automatically get Android WebKit as well. The point is you could make changes in Android WebKit. Um, um, mobile device vendors like making changes. Because consider, you have 78% Android, you know, and roughly half of that is Samsung, and the rest is HTC, Sony, Motorola, LG, uh, Chinese vendors, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, the point is, if they would all run exactly the same Android, you as a, a consumer would not care if you bought a Samsung, an HTC, a Sony, or a Chinese device. They want to differentiate themselves. Samsung desperately wants to be different from HTC, and HTC wants to be different from Sony, and Sony wants to be different from L LG, etc., etc. And this is a very important thing in the uh, Android market specifically, 
because this is the cause for the dreaded uh, fragmentation of the Android market. Because device vendors want to be different. And one of the ways of expressing this difference is through the browser. So Android vendors change stuff in the browser because they can. Not because there's a good reason to, it's just because they can. Well, there's one exception to that, and now I would like to borrow your HTC, please. Because it turns out, um, uh, just take your, web, uh, take your mobile phone, uh, go to any website, I don't care which one, and zoom in so that uh, your, the lines of text don't entirely fit on the screen anymore and you have to scroll. Right? That's annoying. Sometimes you have to zoom in to more than the uh, than the text. Uh, excuse me, to more than the text width, um, because that's just necessary. Um, I need uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what you see, unfortunately, I don't. I, I do have an image, but I have to find it. Wait one minute, I created one. Uh, yeah. So, uh, book. The Android chapter illustrations. Yes, I have images for you. This is typically what you see, right? If you zoom in uh, w way more than the text size. Uh, the lines start to go uh, off the screen and you have to pan horizontally. What the HTC WebKit does, and you can see it here live, I'm going to pass around it now if it's okay. Um, just try it on this text and zoom in and then pass the device on. If anyone else has an HTC, you can always try, uh, also try this. What HTC does is reflow the text. So this is on roughly the same zoom level as the uh, other screenshot, but HTC uh, makes the lines narrow so that they fit into the screen. I kind of like that. I kind of think it's a good idea. In fact, uh, the last time I held this workshop, uh, somebody um, started to talk about his old HTC and how he used to do this and how his new Samsung didn't do it. This is the point of device differentiation. The HCC marketing team would have laughed that at him because uh, he did exactly what they hoped for. He said, okay, my old HCC does this neat little trick that my new Samsung doesn't do. So next time I'm going to buy a phone, I'll go back to HCC. That is the point of device differentiation. Now this, I kind of like this, but of course there's also a drawback because the browser has to reflow the page right now. You know, there's a paragraph below that and that has to drop on the page. And you can uh, kind of uh, find all kinds of uh, stuff that has to reflow on the page. So this is processor, memory and battery intensive, which is probably the reason why the other browser vendors did not implement this. As far as I know, this is just a switch in Android WebKit. You can set this behavior to yes or no. HCC has uh, consistently uh, decided on yes, and the others have mostly decided on no. There was, I think, an old Samsung device three or four years ago that this, uh, did this kind of zooming, but only when you double tapped or something, or only when you pinch zoomed, one of the two. Uh, in any case, uh, Samsung experimented with it and decided not to do it. But this is the kind of differences you can see. And again, they are both Android WebKit. They may even have the same version number. And an HTC Android WebKit 4.1 will display this behavior. A Samsung or Sony Ericsson or LG Android WebKit 4.1 will not. And, and there are more differences like that. So the most important thing you should do is get a lot of Android devices. Uh, I myself have eight or nine now, and of course I use them for compatibility tests, but even if you just build a website, you should test your, uh, you should test your site on many different Android devices. Even though 
at first sight, it appears to be the same browser because it's uh, the same version number. Right? Android WebKit 4.1 is not necessarily the same as Android WebKit 4.1. And this is very annoying, but it cannot be helped. So, that was the old situation. Right, you had Android WebKit, and it uh, went uh, along with the Android version numbers, right? Android 2.2 uh, upgraded to browser 2.3 again, 3.0 uh, again, etc., etc., up until 4.2 or 4.3. Um, then Google decided it wanted to get rid of Android WebKit because it's a distinctly worse browser than Chrome. Chrome is much better, especially in web standard support. There's no doubt about that. So they removed Android WebKit from Chrome, starting with uh, Android 4.4. If you download Android 4.4, you do not get a browser at all. You can do two things. No, you can do three things. First of all, you can take the old Android WebKit and put it on 4.4. I think that's technically possible, but you'd have to do it yourself. Google's not doing it for you again. Uh, the second choice is to create your wholly owned browser. Anyone can create a browser for Android, so that's no problem, but it's a huge investment. And the third uh, thing you can do is uh, take Google Chrome. The problem is uh, Google Chrome is bound up in what's called Google Services. Um, you can choose to take the entire package of Google Services, and the most important uh, component of that is Google Play, the App Store for Android. Uh, basically, if you uh, opt for Google Play, then you also get uh, the Maps application and the YouTube application and Google Chrome, and you can all put them on your device. If you do not want that, if for instance you want your own App Store, you can't use any of those. So it's an either or, and you have to create your own browser. And now we come to the Nokia X. Um, the Nokia X was announced in April, early April, just before Nokia was going to be taken over by Microsoft. And it was an Android phone. And that's unusual because Nokia has never created an Android phone before. They've al uh, always gone their own way with operating systems. And um, me being who I am, I immediately asked, okay, so what's the default browser on this Nokia X? And uh, Max Furtman, uh, he's also a browser uh, researcher, he replied, because of course he's got the Nokia X and I don't, well, it's unfair. Um, Max Furtman replied, yeah, they are trying to create their own Chromium-based browser. But it doesn't work quite uh, good enough yet. For instance, it doesn't have a back button yet, which is kind of a problem in a browser. And um, therefore, next to it, they put Opera Mobile. So the Android uh, X, uh, excuse me, the Nokia X phones come with two default browsers. What I expect to happen is that Nokia will e eventually be happy with its own browser and will ditch Opera again. But that's an expectation. But that's not the point. The point of the story is that apparently Nokia is trying to set up uh, an alternative Android ecosystem. They have decided not to use Google services. Instead, they create their own browser. They create their own app store. They already have Nokia Maps. Microsoft has an IM uh, system, etc., etc. Um, it could be that Nokia and Microsoft together are trying to recreate an alternative to Google services on Android. And that would mean that from, uh, uh, once that system is fully operational, Microsoft competes with Google on Android. Now that would be interesting, wouldn't it? I have no clue how this is going to play out, but this is the reason that I call the Nokia X line uh, the most interesting thing that happened on mobile in the past year. Because so far, Google doesn't really have competition on Android. I mean, certain uh, companies, notably Amazon, just took Android, created their own operating system and their own stuff. But if I understand correctly, the Nokia Microsoft services could also be used by other device vendors. So if in the future Sony is not so happy with Google, they could decide to go over to the Microsoft services instead. 
This is going to be really interesting. Uh, Browser-wise, it means that we will probably have the Nokia browser, which is Chromium-based uh, in the future, instead of Google Chrome. And again, I don't know how much difference this, uh, there will be. I will definitely try to find out for you. Okay. Um, then we have minor browsers on Android. Because if you are a minor browser vendor, such as Opera or Firefox, you of course create an Android browser. Because Android has a huge user base, and you can um, expect at least some users to try your browser on Android. Um, how much does that matter in practice? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Um, if we look at the browser statistics again, uh, Opera is big, but I exp uh, that is mostly Opera Mini on the old devices, what I explained before. Firefox is nowhere to be seen. Um, it was above 1% in one or two countries that I studied, but globally it's not. So far, Firefox uh, has a, uh, a tough time uh, getting traction on mobile at all. Um, and to be honest, I test a lot of other browsers on Android, mostly because just because they're available and you never know what's going to happen. Um, a recent theory I heard is that there's a difference between uh, the Western developed nations and the Eastern developed nations in this respect, that uh, consumers in the Western developed nations tend not to download other browsers because they don't really care about it. They say, well, I've got this browser, it works fine, uh, and then most of them they don't even know they can download another browser. Which is why, especially in the Western markets, the most important thing to know is with which default browser does this phone come. Right, so every time you, especially on Android, when there's a new phone coming out and you should support it, um, you should first try to figure out what the default browser is because 90% uh, of the buyers will actually use a default browser. Now, it seems that in China and to a lesser extent in Korea, this is not the case. I don't know too much about those countries, so I'm just repeating what somebody who does know told me. But it seems that, especially in China, uh, browsers are pretty uh, intertwined with uh, social services. I mean, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese have their own social networks, but they are different from the Western ones, like uh, Weibo instead of Twitter, etc., etc. Um, it seems that they make deals. It seems that especially UC, and to a lesser extent its uh, domestic competitor QQ, um, make deals so that basically consumers download a package, again, which uh, contains a Weibo client and a browser. And that's why uh, Chinese users tend to download more other browsers than Western users do. Again, I'm not totally sure of the facts here. I'm just repeating what I've heard, and I need to he hear the whole story in detail, but there's a difference here. What I do know is that uh, South Korea is one of the countries I follow with uh, browser statistics, and all of a sudden there was a browser called Puffin, Puffin, P-U-F-F-I-N. I downloaded it, installed it. It's a really weird browser. It's, I think, personally, that it's a hybrid between a proxy browser and a full browser. But I'm not 100% sure. Of course, there's no documentation whatsoever. Why should we? Um, but it has 3% market share in South Korea. You can say, OK, I don't care about that. And if you don't create sites for the South Korean market, that makes total sense. Because uh, it's not easy to create good websites for this browser. But it does show that something similar, like in China, is happening in South Korea as well. Again, I unfortunately don't have any more details, but there's a difference here. Especially if you are ever going to create sites that should work in developed uh, Eastern nations, be very careful about your browsers. Make sure that you uh, check the statistics, and please do not assume that they will use the same browsers as we do. They don't. And that's the fundamental difference between mobile and desktop. On desktop, we only really have five choices, right? IE, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Opera. That's it. 
and everybody in the world, well, 99.9% .9 of the people in the world use one of those browsers, and the 0.1% uses kind of a skin over one of those browsers. On mobile, that's different. On mobile, there are plenty of companies who just create a browser. Which raises the question, why do people create browsers? Because it takes a lot of time. I mean, you have to, uh, uh, to pay at least 20 to 30 engineers for at least a year, possibly a year and a half, in order to create a browser at all. Why go to all that trouble? Um, the first and most, most obvious reason is market share. Um, and this especially goes for wealthy companies. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Google uh, over here, and I think one of the big companies in China, but I forget which one, is also working on a browser, and it's just to get their name out more, which is fine. That kind of works. Uh, the second reason is just to make money, because if you create a good mobile browser, there's a chance that you will be bought. This actually happened to the company Torch Mobile. Uh, back in 2009, when I started uh, studying mobile browsers, I just downloaded every browser I could find. And the default browsers of the various platforms were kind of okay. Uh, Safari was good, the rest was kind of okay. And most of the browsers I downloaded were pretty bad, except for one, the Iris browser for Windows Mobile. Um, I really noted that at the time because, wow, this is a uh, uh, downloadable browser that's actually pretty good. That was very unusual. Uh, and a couple of months later, that company was bought by BlackBerry because the old BlackBerry OS 5 and lower phones had a pretty bad browser. And BlackBerry understood that they needed a new browser in order to remain competitive, so they bought a browser vendor. And that could be one of the reasons to create a browser, in order to get bought. And there's a small uh, browser called Dolphin here in California. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I had the feeling about a year and a year and a half ago that they were grooming themselves for acquisition by Facebook. That has not happened. But it still shows that this is a viable business model for creating a browser, hoping you will get bought. Um, then there is uh, another reason, of which I have now completely forgotten. I'm so sorry. Um, wait a minute. So make my oh yes, of course, uh, the search engine deals. Um, every time you search from a browser, from the search bar in the browser, um, that search is logged by the search engine provider, and that search engine provider pays a little money to the browser vendor. This is completely normal and happens in all browsers, desktop and mobile. Um, if people are talking about uh, Google supporting Firefox, it's mostly about this. It's mostly about Firefox users use Google to search, and Google pays a tiny amount of money per search to Firefox. And again, the same goes for all other browsers. So that is another way of uh, making your browser pay. Uh, of course, you have to have a decent market share in order to make a lot of money with that. And most alternative mobile browsers do not. So I do not expect a lot of mobile browsers to stick around, unless they have uh, financial backing of a huge company that can afford to pay uh, 30, 40 engineers indefinitely, or they have, or, or gain uh, a lot of market share. But. Uh, you see is one of the few that is indeed gaining a lot of market share, especially in the developing world, especially with the UC Mini proxy browser. For the rest, I'm not so sure that it's going to happen. But in any case, these are some of the underlying trends of the mobile browser market. Um, I've gone to this story in a different order than I'm used to, so I have to quickly check if there's anything I forgot. I don't think there is. Are there any questions about the browser story? Nobody? I've been perfectly clear? Wow, that's so cool. It's 11.55 now, lunch will arrive in half an hour. I personally will have to use the restroom, so I'm going to do that. Uh, let's take a five minute break and then decide uh, where we go next. Uh,
expecting. So, if you, um, what we're going to do now, um, the touch events I'm going to defer to after lunch because we're not going to make it. Um, so I'm going to ask you again, are there any things I should talk about? Is there anything you would like to know about the mobile web, the mobile? We've had those. I talked about mobile browsers. No, Put these at the bottom. So I already talked a little bit about breakpoints. Uh, I mainly uh, reiterate Stephen Hayes' advice: just resize your browser window, and and when it doesn't look good anymore, it's time for a new breakpoint. I mean, I did a, a survey on my site uh, a while ago about how people use responsive design. Actually, that might be useful to look at. I have to remind myself of the numbers as well. Wait a minute. Uh, because I found the numbers somewhat surprising in some ways. Uh, no, that was not it. Yeah. Um, yeah, 1,200 web developers reacted, so I'm hoping this survey is slightly representative. Um, yeah, the biggest problem I saw back then is uh, the media query device width, which you should not use, was still used by 50% uh, of the respondents. Again, the device width media query is always equal to screen.width and screen.height. And screen up width and screen up height can have two different uh, different definitions based on the browser. Can either mean the ideal viewport or the uh, number of device pixels on the screen, and you don't know which of the two you're going to get. Which is the reason device width should not be used, and width should because it just gives you the width of the layout viewport. Um, then many developers were not aware. Uh, that you need uh, the resolution me media query as well as the WebKit device pixel ratio media query. I showed that in my uh, viewports presentation earlier. Um, yeah, just so you know, I mean, I've made these points and I can't really add a lot to them. Yeah, the next one is interesting. Um, if you want to do something with responsive images, uh, you have to query the resolution. Uh, or uh, device pixel ratio uh, media queries or the JavaScript property, right? Uh, you have to see uh, uh, at which point it becomes useful to send uh, high resolution uh, retina images to the uh, to the user. It turns out, and uh, what I expected was that most people would put uh, the uh, would draw the line at two. So at device pixel ratio 2, which basically means an Apple Retina screen. Turns out the mo uh, most actually used uh, 1.5, which I think is interesting. Uh, and it's also much safer, I think, than 2, because there are a very few browsers that are slightly below 2, not quite 2. So uh, this, is, uh, this is very important. If you do uh, uh, have to check for the resolution or the uh, device pixel ratio for responsive images, use the value 1.5 as a general demarcator. Yes? How do you then incorporate the PPI, the pixels per inch? DPI, yes. Uh, the problem is um, that um, I didn't see, show that in my presentation, no. Um, you have the device pixel ratio, which is 1 or 2 or 2.2, blah, 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 that we saw in the BlackBerry WebKit. And that is uh, in the resolution media query, that's the unit DPPX, dots per pixel. Uh, in the resolution uh, media query, you have to add a unit. I'll show the relevant slide once more. Wait a minute. Oh, I just closed it. 
Um, in any case, uh, you have to use a unit, DPPX, is the same as what comes out of device pixel ratio. The problem with DPI, again, one inch is defined as 96 pixels. So by definition, 96 DPI is equal to one DPPX. So the, U, the DPI unit, uh, 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 you should use it because IE doesn't support the DPPX unit. But in other respects, it's completely the same. And I'm going to show the relevant slide with the media queries again, so that you know what, you, what I'm talking about. Wait a minute. Uh, resolution, yeah. Yeah, this is the one. Right, so this is uh, JavaScript. Window to, oh, I'm sorry. This is JavaScript, window to device pixel ratio. Um, this media query, which is for WebKit based browsers only. Oh, do you have another question? Uh, well, uh, yeah, just I'm trying to understand the, the concept of PPI versus DPI and one being used. You go to the CSS, um, you have the three different units, right? You do the PS. How would they relate back to the, the PPIs, the, the device? Um, they don't. Hardware, right? like, they don't. Uh, the problem is um, when you see the marketing for a new device, they will give you a DPI unit, uh, a DPI number. And that means um, uh, in uh, the ads, it's actual, actually the number of just the width of the device divided by the number of pixels on the screen. Right? It's, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah? No, not totally. Keep going. Okay. Um, so what, what they're doing is just measuring how wide is the device, and they divide the number of device pixels uh, by that, and that gives the DPI of the physical screen. The problem is that there is no way in CSS or, J or JavaScript to figure that out. It's just plain impossible. Well, on that point, there is this two things, right? There is, uh, you take the, the measure of the inches, and then divide it uh, to find the pixels per inch, right? Yes. The yes. And there is the other uh, variable there, the, the density of the pixels. Yes, that, that uh, number of device pixels divided by inches gives D, DPI or PPI, one of the two. And that, again, is something that you see uh, in mobile phone descriptions. You will always. It will give a higher DPI. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt. I mean, the iPhone 4S has a higher physical DPI than the iPhone 3G. Absolutely. Yeah, if you could explain like, how the DPI relates to your CSS unit. They do not. Uh, I think that's that, is, that is the problem. There is no connection whatsoever to this physical DPI. Right? That's just measuring the screen and dividing it by the number of uh, uh, device pixels. That's one thing. And this resolution that I'm talking about is something completely different. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the physical resolution. Yeah. And that is odd, but it's true. And then when it comes to the images that were in fact small, right? Yeah. I mean, um, this is being used for uh, responsive images. But what you... Um, um, so the whole story I told about uh, device pixel ratio in JavaScript and CSS being uh, the ratio between the ideal viewport and the screen size and device pixels, that is all true as far as it goes, but there is a kind of a confusion uh, exactly because the physical resolution of the device is different from the resolution in CSS or JavaScript you get. And on the iPhone, it all happens to work, if you know what I mean. On the iPhone, it just turns out that they are mo uh, more or less the same, but that doesn't necessarily go for other devices. So we see a confusion here between the two, but what, what developers do is use this uh, to figure out whether to send high-res retina images to a browser or not. And that makes sense because uh, the ratio of the, the device pixels to the ideal viewport does tell you something about the device. It just doesn't tell you about the physical device. 
It does not tell you how wide the screen is. And it does not necessarily tell you how many pixels are on it. It's just a ratio. Um, but because the ideal viewport on a retina screen covers many more pixels than on uh, a non-retina screen, which you can see here, right? Um, this is the default situation on uh, any device with JavaScript CSS, device pixel ratio 2. This is going to happen, and that means that you can send high res, uh, that it makes sense to send high res retina images. Um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the physical device. And that is confusing. Yes, it is. And I'm sorry, it, I can't help it. And um, um, this is the best we can do with CSS and JavaScript. And the whole responsive images technique of reading out the device pixel ratio actually makes sense. But not in a context of a physical device. And I am afraid I can't make it any less confusing than that because it's the truth. Maybe we should talk about this later or something. Do, do you understand a little bit what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, oh yeah, I was going to talk about the media queries briefly. So we have this, and what I found in my survey is that instead of two, they use 1.5 here. That's the one thing. And I actually think that's a good idea, so I would give it to you as an advice. Actually, I should change it in this presentation. Now, here, we don't append a unit in the WebKit min device pixel ratio, because it's exactly the same, by definition. But for all non-WebKit bed browsers, we need the resolution media query, which does require a unit. Now, in theory, you could say 2D PPX here, and it would be exactly the same. The problem is that IE does not support the DPPX unit, but it does support the DPR unit. And because, of, as we've seen earlier, uh, one inch is defined as 96 uh, pixels, it means that one D, uh, DPPX is defined as 96 DPI. That's just a definition. It works like that in all browsers. Uh, so uh, in order to uh, get to 2, we have to uh, uh, multiply it by 2 and get 192. So that is why this is the optimum syntax for uh, resolution media queries about responsive images. You know, there's browser issues. How did I get to this? Well, I can't remember. Are there any more questions like this? I mean, I love questions like this because it allows me to, you know, talk more. Nobody? Okay, let me see what's on our list. Um, so I think I've said most that I want to say about responsive images. Again, I have not followed the uh, responsive images discussion closely. Let's just say that it's tricky. The fundamental problem with responsive images is that you need a default. That is, most old techniques said, okay, we're going to do one of two things. Either we are going to download a low-res image and replace it by a high-res image if our uh, media query or our JavaScript shows we should do that, which means you download two images to a retina screen. The other solution is to do nothing and wait for a while in order to figure out uh, what the, uh, whether it's a retina screen or a, uh, an older screen. And that has the disadvantage that you have to wait a little while before serving the images. Um, there is a, a fundamental problem here. Um, what we would really like to have is for the server to know in advance uh, what kind of resolution the, uh, the uh, browser is on. And as far as I know, there is a proposal to extend HTTP with a header that tells you exactly that. 
I mean, the problem is the, com uh, is the communication between the browser and the server. The browser knows what resolution it has, but it has to tell the server. And so far, that means that the user re requests a web page, the web, a web page returns to the browser and has some kind of JavaScript or CSS that goes back to the server and tells the server. So it's an extra round trip. Um, as far as I can see, that is the fundamental problem that has to be solved in responsive images. I mean, there's also, of course, questions of uh, art, uh, art direction and that sort of stuff. Uh, should the uh, low res or the smaller image um, always be exactly the same as the larger image, or should it be a cutout of that image? Uh, those are design questions that I'm going to leave aside. But technically, it's actually pretty tricky to replace one image by another in a way that uh, does not command a lot of bandwidth. Because the problem here is mobile bandwidth. You do not want to download two sets of images over your mobile connection while roaming abroad, even if you have uh, a Retina iPhone. And that is a fundamental problem that has to be solved. Um, they are working on the picture element, but I'm not totally sure. Uh, uh, does, uh, uh, does anybody follow the responsive images discussion closely? Okay. I mean, is there, I mean, have they reached a decision about the picture element yet? Well, I think what's happening is that the decision is effectively deferred because your voice is putting it, and I may have mispronounced his name, is actually writing all the code to put it into WebKit. Your voice, so yeah. So they are standing back it's true. on the standards groups and saying, well, since we need multiple interoperable implementations, yeah. Let's see where this shakes out, okay. and then we'll wrap up the code after, the, uh, back after that. Okay, so it could, in theory, that could mean that we'll have a solution pretty quickly. In practice, I think it will take a little while more. It's available in one of the nightly kits. No. Was it WebKit or Blink that he worked oh, in? I'm sorry, Blink. Blink, yeah. So it's go uh, a, a, a picture element, and I'm not sure which definition they use right now and what the exact syntax is, but it's coming to Chrome. So let's say we can start to use it in two months, as a, just as a test, you know. It's in the Chrome Lightly now. I expect it to uh, stay, uh, remain uh, hidden behind the flag for now. You know about flags in Chrome and Firefox, right? Um, they um, decided that uh, they want to hide certain uh, experimental features from the users. Uh, so you can uh, basically you can go to Chrome dot flags or something Chrome colon colon slash slash uh, flags and you can uh, set uh, all kinds of interesting flags that gives you interesting experimental stuff to sp uh, to uh, play with. The point is uh, that should not be your test browser because the average consumer doesn't know about flags and won't uh, won't enable them. So even if a uh, if the picture element lands in Chrome and it's available behind the flag, the average consumer will not have it. And that's exactly the idea, because web developers should first test it. You know, uh, you, you should all go out and test it, and you will give feedback to the team, and you will say, okay, it's uh, like, uh, it's a good idea, or it should be changed somewhat, etc., etc. So it's, a, it's in that phase now, which is actually a little further than I thought it was. So I'm quite happy. So let's, re I advise you all to revisit this question in full. Just use whatever you're doing right now, and uh, we will revisit this question in full. And I think it's about time for lunch, if I understand correctly. Yes. Um, we are going to break off for lunch now. Um, let's say we take an hour for lunch. <laughs>